There's a line in Sitsi Dangaremba's novel, Nervous Conditions, where, she, where the protagonist says something like, I've been told there's a difference between expatriates and missionaries, but I can't remember the explanation. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, where I grew up, the sort of expatriates in a way replaced the missionaries in the, at, at independence. And they, I mean, many of them were perfectly nice people, no doubt, but they weren't there, I mean, they, they, they weren't committed to the place. And I think one of the differences, for me anyway, in the way that I've moved, is that I am deeply committed to where I am now. I'm not planning to go back. I mean, I, mean, I visit Ghana, I'll be visiting later this summer, but I don't think of it as my home anymore, uh, though it's where I'm from and it certainly shaped me. So I don't think of myself as an expatriate in the way in which the people who were expats around me when I was a kid mm. were expats, and so I don't like the word. Mine is not working. Yeah. It does. Oh. Um, well, when I saw the uh, title, um, I thought, oh, well, I won't go to this. But then I remembered <laughs> that Jim asked me to go to it, and I, I love him dearly. I couldn't bear, I wouldn't know how to tell him, oh, I could never come to something um, with expats in it. Because um, the, the thing about. Uh, the expats that uh, the way I became familiar with the word were these um, really sort of rancid people from England um, who came and uh, sat around and we did things for them and they were always going back to England though they never did uh, and so they they formed a, a, a community in which um, they were by themselves so they were completely dependent on us, and um, so you know, expats. It's a it's a group of privileged uh, people, an overused word now, but true. Um, uh, who, as I say, were incredibly lazy. Um, uh, you know, just really not something I would have aspired to be at all. Um, so uh, when I think of myself in America, I think of myself a actually not as an expat or anything like that. It's very, I think it would be very difficult, even James Baldwin might have had trouble calling himself an expat. But <coughs> I think a black person is, um, even now, is not an expat anywhere. You are a, a black person. I'm an African-American on the whole. I think it's true that when a certain person sees me, they don't say, I'm a, Car oh, there's a black person from the Caribbean. They. <laughs> Their first um, I reaction is, oh, she's black, and uh, not that she's an ex anything, that the first thing um, to uh, about me is that uh, I'm a black person um, and an African American. So the next time you do this, um, <laughs> if there, <laughs> if there, <laughs> I'm not, um, if if there are. Um, Look at who might might come. If it's a group of people who went to Eton in England or some place like that, those are expats. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, as I mean, pretty much what what Kwame and Jamaica said. Um, when I was living in Jamaica, I was I worked in advertising. I was an advertising copywriter, so I was surrounded by expats, and. Uh, and my view of expats was shaped by that, which is basically mediocre people from abroad <laughs> who couldn't hack it in their own countries. <laughs> so let's come to the quote unquote third world because some of us are still, we still go what I call white crazy um, in Jamaica. Because I'd be around, I'm like, and I've, I've actually gotten arguments with some of these people. It's like, you and I both know you could never hack it on Madison Avenue. That's why you're here, because we're idiots every time you open your mouths. So, when, so to move here and to be called something which I've almost called a pejorative, it's like, I'm not that person. I'd rather be called a refugee before I'm called an expat. <laughs> you know, they, they, because I think of, of, the, of, I think of the laziness and I think of, of the mediocrity and I still think of people doing jobs that Jamaicans can do. 
And so I became, when I came here, I became very self-conscious. Because for example, if you are here on a work permit, if you're here on a work permit, every year your school has to, for me at least, every year my school has to advertise my job. And to, the Ameri to pretty much the American population. And every year the school has to convince Homeland Security or immigration that the Jamaican is still the best person. And <laughs> every year I had to prove I was better than hundreds of candidates who applied. So I don't feel like an expat much. <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and this is what I think about it with, with, with the term. I was like, there, there's a certain kind of um, ease in being in a place that you, had, you do not have to participate in. And I think that's another thing. I, you know, I, 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 I participate in the life of this country. You know, I'm involved in things like Black Lives Matter and so on. That, that um, the, the, I don't think, it never occurred to me that I'd have the luxury of wearing white linen suits <laughs> and uh, be, be, befriending the commandante and you know because I will leave first when revolution happens anyway it just never occurred to me <laughs> I love the term expatriate <laughs> <laughs> no I'm kidding unfortunately listen the, uh, the, 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 the term has the tingle of ice in the glass um, it's like Hong Kong and the balcony and things like that. <laughs> and it just doesn't work for me. Um, coming from Ireland, we, we would never uh, term ourselves um, as expats. Um, it seems to me that to, that, that, that to emigrate um, means to wound yourself uh, and, and to leave your country as a form of um, memory making. Um, and, I, and, and I like this idea. Um, and the term um, to, to be an immigrant, to be an emigrant, um, was very, very important to the idea of the Irish experience. However, uh, in more uh, recent years, uh, the Irish have become commuters, and we, we, we sort of uh, belong in several different places um, all at once. And um, I will never forget, I'll just tell you a quick story about um, talking to the great English writer John Berger, who has been away from England uh, and he would he would crucify the 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 the, the, the term expat, and um, we were um, we happened to be hanging out. We were in Paris, and we were a tiny little bit overserved. <laughs> <laughs> we became intimately acquainted with uh, a couple of darkly tinted bottles, um, <laughs> and I said to him, I, I knew John's work inside out, and I'd been quoting it and saying all these things, and I said to him like late in the evening, said John, John, where are you from? And he looks at me, well, well you know, I'm, I'm from London. But then I said in that, like, uh, where are you from from? <laughs> <laughs> or rather, where are you from from? <laughs> and he, he, and he's, he's a brilliant man, as you all know. And he, he took the question and he waited for a while and he said, well, uh, I, am, I am a citizen. And I said, no, no. I am a patriot of elsewhere. And I thought that was absolutely extraordinary. I think it's, it speaks to the, the experience of people uh, upon the panel here today, mm. patriots of elsewhere. Um, well, I, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Wait a minute. I can. Oh, yeah, I hate, I hate the Beyonce microphone holding thing, but I, okay, I can do it. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I've been called many different things since I came to the US. Uh, not that long ago, about eight years ago. Um, things that I never knew I, I was, or I never knew I was. Um, alien, to start off with, was a great one. Um, the first alien non-resident, then alien resident for tax purposes, but not for immigration pur purposes then alien resident. I think, I think now I'm an alien resident. But that's what yeah, you become. Sure. I think I'm al you're always an alien, just mm. different le levels of residency. Um, also, a few months after I'd arrived, some really bad magazine contacted me to see if I could write a column about dating in New York <laughs> from the point of view of a woman of color. And so I told a friend of mine um, who's African-American, one of my closest friends here, and I said, 
what is this woman of color date thing? Like, first of all, like, what, what does it mean? I'm, I'm like, I'm not a woman of color. And he, he laughed at me and he said, of course you're a woman of color. And uh, it was really, uh, really shocking. And then really um, um, a, a, like a, a process to assume a category that had been placed upon me. Now it's, now it's something that I carry like a badge, right? Uh, but at that moment, it was more shocking than anything else. Like uh, um, to to be to be coined something, to to have to to have to below belong to an, an invented segment uh, um, of of the population. Um, and now expat, I had never been called expat before. This is the first time I'm called expat, <laughs> <laughs> and it's <laughs> part of the repertoire, I guess. Um, I, I mean, I would I would hate to disagree as well and, and, and create some kind of polemic here, but I can't disagree with any of you. I, I don't, it's not a term that I like. It's a term that's also very um, Anglo-Saxon. There isn't a term in, in, in Spanish that's quite like expat. So it's not a term that I've ever uh, thought um, to define my own being and not being part of. Um, it, I think it presupposes a fatherland, the patria, um, and it presupposes also then a very strong bond with that kind of center uh, that one has uh, exited from, right? And I don't have that relationship with any country, as probably a few of us here don't. Um, I I've never lived in any country for more than a few years, so I don't I don't I didn't exit that patria or or that fatherland. Mm -hmm. well, let's I, you had a statement uh, uh, that I read somewhere that I really liked a lot. You talked about being in New York and choosing New York as a place to live. Uh, or to, uh, you said, I decided New York was the place I wanted to live because it was the place where I felt exactly the right le equilibrium between being foreign and being at home, which I think is really wonderfully, wonderfully put. Mm. You know, I wonder if you'd say something about elaborate on that. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, it is. I think also the the theme of of foreignness in New York is is at once interesting, um, but also kind of an everyday thing for all of it. I think ev so many people here um, are in a situation in which they uh, are somehow foreign to the city and always in a process of coming to terms with it or or becoming involved with it in different ways. Uh, as as you were both saying. Through Black Lives Matter, for example, though it's not it's not a fight uh, that is uh, like an, a national fight. It, it is an, an, a different kind of, of of struggle that that engages you more deeply with 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 a space. Um, I mean, I I guess something that I've that I've always struggled with in New York in terms of my foreignness is is. Being a Mexican in New York, there's a big Mexican population in New York. Most of it uh, of, the, of this population is is uh, invisible, in the sense that, uh, in, in a physical sense, m most Mexicans in New York work underground in the in the either in the kitchens or in the bodegas under the delis that we walk through. Um, my my daughter always asks me, you know, like like. Who's down down there? Because you you walk and there are these metal flaps that open up sometimes. And she used to think it was like a scary space, uh, the, where there might be like witches or something. And um, I said, no, it's, it's a lot of Mexicans. <laughs> so she really loves <laughs> peeking in now and saying, hola, <laughs> everyone's in again. Um, but it's an invisible population that's rarely mapped. Ver ver I mean, m visible if you, for example, uh, are the kind of people that try not to uh, hit um, bicycle, uh, bike, bike riders. Um, because if you notice, most of the bike riders in New York are Mexicans. They're always uh, wearing their chains like Emiliano Zapata, uh, their bicycle chains like this. And they're like the, the real like warriors in bicycles in New York, right? There's all these guys in like gear and like tiny little asses uh, cycling away, uh, but then comes the Mexican guy with the cr crossed uh, chains, and he just always overtakes the guy that's been <laughs> that's really been trying to work hard for it. Uh, but to find my own space within that Mexican population has been a challenge, um, and 
finding a, a, like a sense of belonging and a distance at the same time. Um, it's something that I work on, I guess, every day. Yeah. Experience that, that you would identify with as well. No, I, I'd actually like to propose something a, a little bit contrary um, to, to to that. I don't feel foreign uh, here at all, and, and and a lot of the people that I know, especially writers, don't feel um, uh, foreign here at all. And I'm sure you, you, you we 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 would agree in, in 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 many ways. But um, one of the things that I think that's brave and 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 and. Uh, tough and muscular, um, particularly about the American literary establishment, is that you are allowed to come here and to retain your uh, your foreignness or your Irishness or your uh, you know if you're Sasha Heyman, you can still be Bosnian and American at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many writers, Juno Diaz, the, the, uh, many of the people, well, I won't presume to speak to, for, for anyone on the stage, but certainly for myself, Yi Yun Lee, uh, people like that who are allowed to come here and uh, they don't strip away the citizenship of where you came from. I think this is a very brave American idea and it wouldn't necessarily happen in other parts of the world. I think it would be very difficult to go to Ireland and to be a person directly yeah, of true. two countries. Yeah. And I think um, that, 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 that we must applaud um, some of the, 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 the democratic and radical um, experience that goes on here, that sort of radical welcoming where you can actually come to, say, certainly the city um, and be someone new directly um, on, 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 on the next day. And um, I sort of applaud that notion that um, I'm allowed to hold on to my country because I couldn't come here if I had to say goodbye to my country. I couldn't come here if I had to be labeled uh, an, an expat. Um, that would uh, that that would just wound me too too deeply. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I just want. Um, I certainly would like to ask Juno Diaz about that, but um, <laughs> mainly what what you say, uh, you really ought to think about that because I think it's very easy for you. You're a white man. Nobody notices. In fact, you have a huge. Uh, um, distinguished history coming from Ireland. Uh, there are a lot of Irish people who have come to America and disenfranchised a lot of other people in their process of becoming white. So I, I think you should, this great democratic, um, yeah, it sounds wonderful and it's, I'm sure it's a nice thing uh, for you to say about America. Um, Americans will really like that. Um, a lot of them, but you know, um, uh, in contrast to you, my experience, um, uh, it, I didn't feel I was just sort of stepping into this grand uh, literature and welcoming uh, uh, and so on. I mean, I still don't uh, feel like feel like that at all. So um, I would um, not universalize that so much. Just say, me, a white guy from Ireland, met this experience, and I'm really glad, I'm really glad you had it. I don't wish to be a white guy, but I'm glad that white guys enjoy themselves so much. <laughs> I, yeah, well, yeah, I... I uh, no, but I, I, I also, I mean, you know, I... I do think the the one there's a difference between New York or California and I think America, and I think that because you know for example I mean my first novel was published by Riverhead but everybody else rejected it mm -hmm. and the second my first the second novel sorry first one was rejected by nearly eighty people I think that even this sort of it's one of the reasons why me and a bunch of writers of color have declared that we will never be on a panel on diversity ever again. <laughs> um, you've heard me say it publicly. Um, because I think there is this lip service diversity and there is this lip service type of melting pot salad bowl thing. So we are allowed to be, I'm allowed to be Jamaican, but a certain kind of Jamaican, a certain kind of antiseptic um, Jamaican. 
um, we're lo- so I think I, I'm, I you know I, I kind of I agree with I agree with Jamaica on this. I think there is, uh, it's like when I you know when I you know got into a lot of trouble of talking about pandering, and I won't re- revisit that. Um, but when you know a, a, a Nigerian writer go, yeah, mm-hmm. there is my there is my Nigerian voice, and there is my Nigerian voice for America voice, and and I'm not talking right wing people. I'm talking people who speak about diversity and the new liberal and so on. And I, I, I think, and, and when I said, to the point where we even know what that prose should look like. And it's not a, dis- it's a I think, um, I think we are allowed to hold on to our identity, but I, I, I think the, the, to me, even the allowed part may be problematic. I'm not asking for permission. But I do think that it's a, uh, for certainly for me, I've certain uh, been enough to experience that we're we're allowed to hold on, and have this dual thing. But even that dual thing is a is a is a is a is a, is, is a dual thing. I see in Sex in a City dual. <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a dual thing. I see on cable TV dual. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still a kind of 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 sort of something that's palatable enough that it's still a kind of generic. I'm trying to. I'm trying to wrap myself around the Sex and the City. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> I draw for the first things that are at the top of my head. No, no, no. <laughs> it was either that or a lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> so. I have to no, say, really I mean, uh, I, I, I came here, you know, in my late twenties, and I mean, two things do strike me as welcoming about this country. One is that, um, though I came here a long time ago and I still talk like this, um, when I say I'm an American, people don't fall about laughing. Uh, Whereas, I think in many other countries you could go to, if you sort of didn't talk like the regular people and came from somewhere else and you said you were an ex, they would just fall about laughing. They would just say, no, you're not, you're not really. And here I think, you know, citizenship, which I have, is kind of it. I mean, and it's open to, uh, we have a long history of exclusions, but it's open now, in principle, to anybody who can get in. It can be hard to get in. It's easier to get in if you have a PhD in philosophy from Cambridge than it is uh, for lots of people. But, but, but once you're in, sort of, you're in. I like that. Second thing, I, a form of welcome that I am very conscious of, which is also interesting to me, is that I, uh, f- I'm not... I don't have an experience that's at all like, I mean, when I came, before I got here, I had read James Baldwin and Richard Wright. I knew about Martin Luther King. I knew America was a racist country where you risked being shot. I knew all the basic facts. But but I had no real sense of the African-American experience, meaning the experience of the, the descendants of America's slaves. And yet every black family in this country that I've ever met has welcomed me in as if I was a brother even though I talk weird and, <laughs> and I don't really have any connection with them. And I find, I mean, that is, I don't, I, now I do because I've been a professor of African American studies and I've studied it, but I didn't grow up with it. And I'm, I find that, I, I, I mean, sometimes when I think about that, I'm moved almost to tears by, <laughs> by that welcome that I, that I expressed from, you know, people like Skip's family, whom I got to know when I first got here. <laughs> I wasn't, you know, they didn't know anything about my life. And I didn't know anything about theirs. But somehow, they let me in immediately uh, in a kind of mad way, really. Uh, And it was very moving to me. So I I do feel I've been welcomed in a bunch of ways that I don't think would happen in a lot of other places. Mm -hmm. Um, But just in a way, we got a bit stuck with the expatriate word. Uh, I mean, the, the sort of the thought behind this was, was to think about how the experience of moving around in these ways affects your relation to things like language and, and so on. And it does seem to me that um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I think it's very different. Um, you know, I've, I, I grew up speaking two languages, but one of them was English. Um, and uh, I grew up, as many people in the world did, listening to American television as a child. So 
the sound of American voices, black voices, white voices, uh, southern voices, northern voices, that was in my ear long before I got here. So I don't feel, the language didn't, it wasn't my language, but it didn't seem strange to me when I got here, because I'd already, because you know, many people in the world have just been listening to this language uh, in the Anglophone world, which is a large world, an awful lot of people in the, in the world, in countries where English is the, is the government language, and in those countries, mostly, you know, Dallas was playing in the 70s, yeah, yeah. and you got to hear it. So America didn't seem, in that sense, so strange. And as I said, we were brought up in our house, which was a pan-Africanist household, to read um, Baldwin, Wright. Actually, Wright talks about part of my family in, in, uh, in one of his books. So we knew the, some of these people. And I... Um, so I feel that uh, it's not like the experience, uh, it's not like an expatriate experience where you come from, the, the, the Anglophone expatriate experience, where you come from England to this strange place and you don't really, and everybody talks in a language you don't know except when they're talking to you and so on. It's not like that at all. It's a very different kind of move in relation to language, I think, yeah. for me anyway. Yeah. I think that's important um, that for most, certainly for me and, and for you and a lot of us, uh, we, we, I think part of the, 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 the program says about unfamiliarity, sort of an unfamiliarity with, with, with you know, dislocation, unf unfamiliarity with where we're moving to. But actually, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of cases, most, certainly when, before I moved there, I was already in a heavy dialogue with America. Um, I was in a heavy dialogue with American culture. Um, uh, you know, last week was a pretty devastating week for me. Um, and it's not been since I came to America at New Prince. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you check my high school yearbook, it says ambition to work for Prince. I think that there, <laughs> it actually is in the yearbook. You can check Facebook. Well, but they, well, they, I remember you saying that the, when you went to Minnesota for the first time, yeah. your knowledge of the state came from Purple Rain. So yeah. From the film. So what I'm saying is that we, 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 there, was all, there was already that kind of dialogue with the country whether the, the, the America of our, of our minds and the America, because a lot of what we think is America is actually just Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But I think that creates the, a different kind of series of questions and observations that we as writers, when we're not living here, um, pick up. But the, the, we are, yeah, that, that was a reality for me. Who shot JR was a very big deal. <laughs> um, so there was already a kind of, I think the, the, the whatever we're gonna call ourselves, we are, we are entering a country that we already have a kind of dialogue or at least a familiarity with, or we think we have a familiarity with because we're so, we participate so much in the popular culture of it. Mm. And I think that's important. That's a crucial difference between coming to somewhere that you know nothing about and plan to have no attachment to and coming to somewhere where you already have a language, whether it's a true language or not. Mm. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think what's interesting about coming here too is that, um, that um, you are, um, you know, you come, uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, I would come from a place where, 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 where the writer would be uh, more revered than she is or he is here. And so then as an immigrant writer, um, you're forced into a sort of reckless inner dissent. Um, and the place of dissent for, 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 for the the writer who comes here is a really fascinating one, um, and trying to make a place for yourself uh, within that, the, the, where, where, where the writer doesn't matter as much um, as he or she did or could in her home country. Do you write about the place that you came from? Like Joyce said, I, I've been so long out of Ireland, I all at once hear her voice in everything. And so he was, uh, he was very interested in writing about Ireland by being away from Ireland. Um, and so the, 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 the contradiction that you have to hold when you leave your place and you come somewhere like this is, uh, so where will that dissent come from and how will I talk about my, uh, my home place? Hmm. Just to, to close off um, the, the, the theme of, of welcome and not welcome that we, that we sort of left hanging, um, not to close it off, but to, to add something to that conversation. Um, I, I also don't feel quite welcome uh, in many 
situations as a Mexican here when there's stadiums full of people shouting, let's build a wall. Um, so it's a very, I mean, there's many levels of, of, um, of belonging, right? And in, in, in many of those levels of belonging, I don't feel welcome either. Um, but I do think that the literary world here is maybe larger than the one in Mexico, uh, more diverse, um, more international, but also more diverse within um, within the, the national writers here, um, more diverse racially. Um, I mean, most Mexican writer, uh, white writers are white, and uh, there is very little recognition to, to writers that don't write in Spanish in Mexico, for example. Um, and the literary world, the, the, crit the critics are so mean that I definitely don't feel welcome <laughs> in Mexico. No, 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 in Mexico. Oh, Mexico. <laughs> like you don't want your books reviewed in Mexico. <laughs> they cut off your head like the capos and the narcos. Um, yeah, they're brutal. So in that sense, I feel really welcome here. <laughs> People are so nice. Uh, but, um, but then to, to try to go back to this other... other um, discussion that's opening up that's perhaps more interesting that has to do with language. Um, just in an anecdotal sense, I, I learned English when I was five years old uh, while living in, in South Korea um, in, an, in, a, in an American military school. Um, it was an Ameri it was, they were basically soldiers that had become kind of expats and had decided to live in Korea and had uh, Korean-American kids there. Um, but because my parents were, in a way, fiercely nationalist as Mexicans, they wouldn't allow me to watch TV, because it was only American TV that was programmed by the American base. So I, didn't, I never had that relation that you talk about with America, um, in which you slowly build a kind of cultural familiarity through these many strata of, of cultural references and programs. And I never watched The Simpsons until I had my own kids. Um, so I missed all these references. So my, my, m when I arrived here, and I, I spoke kind of weird English, um, I mean, maybe more, I, I grew up later in South Africa, so it was more South African, and I had no knowledge of, of the kind of sunny side up um, idiomatic expressions of, of, of America. Um, so that has been a, like a, a, diff a really difficult thing to relearn English uh, which is not, which is also my second language. Although the language I learned to write and read and before my before Spanish, um, without that that strata that you're talking about, I, I don't know if others have had that experience. Um, well, I didn't see television until I was 19 years of age. I'm older than everybody here, I think. Mm -hmm. So I I don't have a yeah. um, familiarity that you talk about. Uh, that you all talk about um, as a formative experience. I grew up in what was, um, well, Britain wasn't a colonial power still, but we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we knew. <laughs> but no one told us, so I don't, I don't have any familiarity with um, an ease with American culture, though I I, I did always want to look like um, an uh, African-American woman in Ebony magazine. I loved Ebony magazine. And I loved African-American culture in the way I saw, saw it um, through Ebony magazine and things like that. But the, the thing uh, that you, you're talking about, uh, um, uh, America, familiarity with American culture, uh, um, giving you an ease, I, st I still... I still don't have it. I still um, am very much, I think, uh, uh, in relation to language, very much uh, a person of um, colonial uh, Britain, that my whole um, relationship to literature uh, uh, be begins maybe with Chaucer, but definitely ends just before Kipling. <laughs> And, and and the reason it doesn't include Kipling is because um, yeah. people thought Kipling was just Kipling. And um, so no one, it was sort of something you read for fun. It wasn't really 
you know, yeah, it wasn't really literature. Um, so, um, so my my writing um, is not at all uh, informed by um, American culture, and I do see the difficulty uh, my relationship to um, uh, uh, literature, uh, the problems my work prov uh, presents to an American um, who's always wondering why the sentences are so long, why the mm -hmm. uh, rep repetition, and you know, and I'll say, well, you know, the influence is the Oxford Dictionary, the King James Version of the Bible, Milton, something, and they and absolutely no one um, can understand why I would have read the Oxford English Dictionary from A to Z as a child, but I did because I had nothing else to read, and no one understands why that would be so. So this fam familiarity still um, with uh, uh, writing, uh, with American culture, I, I, I don't have, I don't understand a lot of American things I read. I understand all sorts of things about American culture. I love, um, I love things that oh, you'd be too embarrassed to do. Uh, um, uh, that I I love, but but when I sit down to write, when I sit down to think about the world, it has absolutely nothing uh, to do with uh, American anything. The American um, love of a story that has a beginning and an end, and the absolute hateful closure, <laughs> the absolutely hateful thing you call closure. I have no interest in it at all. <laughs> well, I was about to ask you if that, if that uh, sort of lack of context and understanding was in some, in some way productive, but I think you answered that, you know, more or less with, like, with what you just said. Um, Very productive for me. Um, but I think unsatisfying to um, an American readership. So in, in a way, uh, what that means is that the audience I have, the, my audience belong, is on an island. The people I'm among is on a continent, a powerful continent. And the powerful continent produces so much disturbance that the uh, citizens of the continent, the American continent, would like when they sit down to read a book, to be so, offered some solace about the human condition, and I insist on offering none. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to follow up on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it does raise the interesting question mm. of the audience. Um, I wonder how much this, you know, is something you're, you, you think about, Mullen, for example, um, your leadership. You've I it. wonder, you know, the, the, I didn't realize this until somebody pointed it out to me that um, the American section of my book is in a, it's, to them reads totally different than the Jamaican section. And it says, it's not just that the subject matter changed. She says, she can tell I changed. And I think that, um, and it's coming from something that, that ties into something Colum, Colum says, Colum said that, you know, fun, I know I could never write that novel in Jamaica. And I think there is a sort of, of a, a freedom to be exactly the type of writer that's in my head. Mm -hmm. And to have everything that is up here to come down exactly that way on the page. I don't mean without editing and stuff like that. But they, that, um, and it's, it's a roundabout answer about audience. It actually made me care less, but not in the sense that I don't care about people reading, but in the sense that I don't fear putting the novel that I have in my head down on the page. And I think being here, and I think sometimes being uprooted or being in, 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 in that kind of in a, a space like that can actually become a safe space where you can create. Because I'm writing, especially when I'm writing, you know, very political stuff like what I, I wrote recently, um, being in my home country, I think, would have resulted in a different kind of novel. I actually think it would have resulted in a kind of failure of nerve. Um, and I, I mean, I'm going to talk you know, about myself. There are lots of people who are perfectly capable of writing pretty explosive stuff in their countries. Look at the great South African literature that came out during apartheid. Mm -hmm. But for myself, I think I needed that kind of, of foreign space, that whole, and I mean, I'm not all the way in flipping Minnesota. So, 
you know, and I, and I, th and that this novel, which is a, was written there, mm -hmm. and I think, I, I, yeah, I'd be lying if I said being in that space didn't result in, and not just in terms of content, but even in terms of form. Mm -hmm. The idea, again, because I grew up again, you know, literature stopped at the end of the Victorians. So the idea of writing something like Molly Bloom's soliloquy would never have occurred to me. That would have been called bad writing. Bad enough Irish people did it. <laughs> so it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have even been taught Irish people. Uh, so the, the, just writing in that way, again, it was being in this kind of mm -hmm. sort of, let's call it suspended space mm -hmm. that allowed that. Well, was it, uh, when, you, when you talk about that suspended space, is it something very specific about the place you ended up, or is it just the, or is it more the experience of, of being somewhere else? I think it's the experience of being somewhere else, because a lot of the, of the, I've written two novels now where uh, the bulk of it was written on the road. Uh, you know, I, I wrote my second novel when I was on tour for the first one, mm -hmm. and a lot of this was written, I just got used to, be, to writing in shifting space, um, uh, you know, this, I, 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 have a, I have a desk, I have, I have an office, I have never been there. <laughs> um, even when I'm home now, I will have an have a office, I have a computer, have everything, and I'll crouch down on the floor in the living room and write, mm -hmm. or go downstairs or something. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just, I, I don't know at what point it happened, but s being in this sort of, con just started to just, Instead of waiting for this state of flux to be over so I can create, I just started to create influx. And that's, you know, what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I, I, do you have something to... Sure, no, I, I, I'd agree with what Marlon has to say. And I just struck with the, um, with the, with the image of, um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, truck drivers, to keep themselves awake, uh, they cut their hands. Uh, they cut their fingers, and they, they have two tricks. They cut their fingers to keep themselves awake, so they sort of wound themselves to keep themselves awake as they're driving down the road. Um, but they also um, inhale sulfur. They light matches, and then, and, and then they, 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 they um, flick them out, and they inhale the sulfur. Do I don't know. <laughs> like, I was on the road for a long time. When, it, when, when I came to the States, I actually was like, uh, um, I, I took a bicycle across the United States for a year and a half, ended up doing about 8,000 miles on the road, met all sorts of crazy people. But um, it seems to me that, 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 that writers who come to this place do somewhat of the same thing. And we're looking for that moment of struckness. We're, we're looking for that moment, uh, moment of pain in order to remember or to keep ourselves awake. As I to, love the to matches. What we came from. The matches is a trick that always does it for me. Does it work? The, yeah, the sulfur. Do you do it? Always. Yeah, yeah, of course. Sulfur, sulfur jags your brain. It Absolutely. gets into your brain. Go Immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, but also about the use of sulfur. <laughs> Go to writing and uh, staying awake. But emigration as a form of sulfurizing. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say something about um, the kind of writing that I mostly do, which is academic writing, uh, though for <coughs> not for specialists. Uh, I don't write just for specialists, but still. And the fact is that... Um, um, a really well-selling book of the sort that I write will sell 30,000 copies if you're lucky. Um, and there are about 100,000 serious readers in America of the sort of thing that I do. So <laughs> my audience is not America. Um, and it includes people in... Ghana and South Africa and Australia and uh, India and Britain who are also engaged in these academic conversations. And we speak a, a jargon that is relatively transnational, even though American academic life plays a large role in, in it because there's, there's so many of us, so many more of us than there are of people in most other places. We have a huge academy. Um, so... I um, have not, you know, basically for me, uh, I sort of write like the people I read, <laughs> and that's how we understand each other. And, um, and so I, I haven't actually ever had to think about this country very much as 
as an issue about writing um, because of the kind of writing that I mostly do. When I've, I have written some novels, but they're not worth talking about, so I won't discuss that. <laughs> question of thinking about the audience. I, mean, I, I wanted to ask you about, to talk about the, the, the book that you wrote, The Story of My Teeth, and to talk about the way that that was in some way a collaboration from, from a, a distance, but also involved social, oh, not social media, the internet, MP3s, and working with um, the, a particular audience in, in Mexico City in the, in the creation of the, of the novel. Uh, can you say something about that? Um, yeah, sure. I I mean, the, the novel came out um, from a commission at first. I was, I was trying to write my second novel, and I was trying to write it in English. I've been writing in both languages for a long time, uh, forever, I guess, but, um, but I've, my three books, my three published books, are written originally or kind of in Spanish, and then, or some English, but I always rewrite in Spanish, and then they're translated into English. And then I revise them for, for a year and rewrite them um, partially in English. Um, and I was trying to write one, a novel uh, directly in English and struggling um, for other reasons, not, not so much linguistic. But um, at some point, I was commissioned by, a, by a, um, a big art gallery, an art collection, really, called the Humex Collection. Um, it's one of the biggest, most important contemporary art collections in, in I guess, one of the ones in the world. Um, but strangely enough, their money comes from, from a juice factory. So there's a factory that produces juice, and it's kind of a monopoly. It's called Humex, Jugos Mexicanos, so Humex. Um, and the money, the revenues from that buy, buy contemporary art. And I thought that that relation was, was, if not fascinating, at least disquieting, right? Um, so when they commissioned me to write a fictional piece for the gallery, I said that I would be more interested to write for the factory. Mm -hmm. And then they said, no. So then I said, no, then I won't do it. Um, so, we, so we negotiated a bit, and finally, finally um, um, we found a way to make it possible, in which I basically sent an installment to the factory, and it was printed like a chapbook, and then um, handed over uh, to, to different workers in the factory. Um, to see if you might be interested in reading. And at the end, 12 people decided that they would be interested, and then they formed a reading group, and they got together once a week to read the installment and criticize it a lot, always, and <laughs> suggest like, changes, and like, it should go this way, or no, this is what should happen. Or, um, or just try to interpret it, and that helped me a lot, because I never know what I'm doing when I'm writing, but at this time, there were people interpreting as I was writing, which was a really strange experience, um, but also gave me a direction. So um, um, that all of that, what happened in those sessions, was set back to me in an MP3, as you say. Not that I, I'm, I'm terrible with technology. I, I use my email, and that's it. I don't use many other things. But I, I, I know how to send an MP3 file and receive it. So um, I, would, I would receive an MP3 file back and, and listen to those sessions, and then write the next installment. Um, with no previous plan, of course, because I, I first had to hear what the what the workers said in order to respond with with the next. It's very nineteenth century, actually. Yeah, it's, it's a serial it's novel. A, it's a serial novel. It's yeah. a Dickensian kind of thing, mm -hmm. just with with email in between. Yeah, but it incorporated the audience in an interesting way. It did, and I and I guess it it it, it brought me back to be. to Spanish as well. More than the audience, it was about hearing Spanish, um, like real Spanish, not like. Spanish in, inside a group of workers who are discussing, um, and I call I use I, I during that period I called my my uncle a lot who who the character is fun is partly based on he, my uncle was a salesman in a big market, and he's he's, he's a big storyteller uh, always tells stories about things that he sells, often I think things that were not so legal, um, <laughs> but um, or purchased in a legal way <laughs> but he's very good at telling stories about them so i heard his voice it, it was a way of connecting back to to real spanish not kind of um um yeah sort of extraterritorial spanish which is what i hear and speak now probably i love that idea of of, of real spanish and, and and 
and accessing that 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 old language. I will say, like I've written books about like the homeless people who live in the subway tunnels of New York. I've written a book about like a, a gay Muslim ballet dancer, Rudolf Nureyev, about like um, Romani people in uh, Slovakia. What um, and then uh, a book called Let the Great World Spin, which takes place in New York. The whole time over the course of uh, nine books, I always think that I'm still writing an Irish novel. <laughs> and that's really important to me. And, 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 and even if this accent gets in under your accent, as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm still always writing about uh, the place that I came from. Is that old fashioned? Is that silly? Is that, uh, I, I, I don't know yet. But I'm still clinging to the notion that no matter what I'm doing, I'm still writing an Irish novel. Yeah, I, I, I see, I see that. Um, can you hear? Yeah. Um, and of course, my model for an audience, um, uh, I draw, I draw on, and I, and until you said that, I hadn't really understood that this might might be the case, but. Uh, my model for an audience are the Corinthians, you know, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And, of course, no Corinthians read it. <laughs> and, and so I always think, um, yes, the people of Antigua are Corinthians. I'm going to write something to them. They'll never read it. They don't, or when they do, they want to kill me for it. But... The thing is, there are no Corinthians anymore. However, Paul's letters, that's what I want to write, is Paul's letters <laughs> to the Corinthians. <laughs> Let the Corinthians go, but the letters will persist. That's what I want. That's my ambition. Um, why don't we uh, see if there are any uh, questions from the, from the audience? And thank you for um, being patient with our passing of the mics and our, our own yeah. technological issues. So, um, Does anyone have any, any questions they'd like to ask? I think we've got time for three. Uh, why, don't, why don't I go to you first, please? Okay. Um, and um, there's a mic to... coming, sorry. Not to speak. Okay. okay, thank you very much. This has been very interesting. I wanted to ask, you mentioned briefly about like different levels of belonging to a place. And um, since you travel quite a bit and you have lives where you like, how do you feel? When do you belong? You know, when do you like? How do you know when do you belong? If you live in play in many places, and you keep traveling, and you, you know, how do, you, how do you know that? Just the feeling, or. Uh, the question is about about belonging and where do you belong? I mean, um, Ondaatje, Michael Ondaatje, one of my favorite writers, talks about the international mongrels of the world. I mean, he's born in Sri Lanka, educated in England, goes to Canada, and writes his first uh, uh, book about um, a turn-of-the-century jazz musician down in New Orleans. Mm. I think he belongs in that sort of elsewhere. And I like the idea that, 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 that there is this new space where you belong in the territory. Now, but, but that, for a writer, brings up several issues of cultural arrogance, economic arrogance, gender arrogance, and so on. You know, What do you have a right to talk about? Mm. Um, <coughs> I remember um, Roberto Bolaño said, a writer's only home is a bookstore. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was a really, really powerful, powerful quote until it took me four years to get into a bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so even there, it's a pretty rarefied space. I, I don't know. I think, I, 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 I think belonging for me is, is, is both a sort of really expansive and really reductive thing at the same time. I am... I really feel I be belong in wherever I flip open my laptop and start writing, in a way. And, and I think that's, that's important to me. Going back to Jamaica, I realize how much it home, that how, how much I realize, one, how much home was important to me, and also how, much, how little I belong there. So I don't know. I, 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 I think a certain kind of, of lack of belonging is kind of important for a writer, in a way. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think a, a, a certain driftlessness is important. I think writers do end up being kind of wandering souls, um, you know, to a bit. So yeah, it's it's. Next week I might have a different answer to that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you have, have kids or not, Marlon. But um, 
I think that when you do have kids, sense of belonging begins in PTA meetings. <laughs> and it's horrible to belong. <laughs> but that's, that's a different thing. A, a parent is a parent and a writer is a writer. A writer is a traitor. But we are, at the same time, both things. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, I beg no, to disagree. I take, I take I... exception to the PTA is belonging. <laughs> I think the PTA is belonging to the parent, but a writer is not. In I the just PTA. cannot associate uh, myself as parent and writer. I think I I I, I write. No. no, no, no. <laughs> Well, <laughs> maybe tonight you will. <laughs> I don't agree. <laughs> um, you know, I, um, questions about belonging are like questions about identity. They, you can only answer them in a kind of contextual way. That is. It depends on you know what kind of belonging you're talking about and what mood you're in when you're being asked and who's asking you, I think, how you answer questions like that. Um, but I certainly, I, I like a remark of, of Gertrude, one of many remarks, fine remarks by Gertrude Stein, who said that there, there wasn't much use to roots if you couldn't take them with you. Uh, she hated, she, she, I mean, her, activity, her main activity was Killing metaphors, and, and that's uh, and that's that's one of the metaphors she effectively killed, I think. But um, so I feel, you know, um, if I go back to the house which we still own that I grew up in, uh, which is it's full of other people. I mean, it isn't empty. <laughs> uh, we have tenants, but I think when I'm there, I sort of think I remember belonging there, uh, but I don't belong there now. And if I, uh, I, I remember. You used to read about writers in Russia being uh, forced into internal exile. You know, you, the, the government said you had to live in Novosibirsk or somewhere. And I have always thought that uh, I would be perfectly happy to be in, have internal exile to, say, Tribeca uh, <laughs> imposed upon me, because I think I would still be able to relate to all the other places that I have relationships with without ever going there, and I do, if my truth is, I belong in my house with my husband, basically, and that happens to be in Tribeca right now. <laughs> uh, can I just say that I would, I would love to say that I would be a writer and a parent both um, at, the, at, at the same time, and in many ways that um, I, I, sometimes I become the son of my son, for instance. Um, in, 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 in that I am fascinated by what he is fascinated by, and he leads me in, 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 in all sorts of different directions. But I think you can embrace both um, at once and sort of, uh, and, and, and I don't think you have to say a writer is a writer, a parent is a parent. I think you can, you can, you can, you can helix these things together. Um, and and, and, and that, that's, that's where I would stand on, on, on that notion. Hi. Um, do you think about writing about place intentionally, as far as um, as form or st or structure, intentionally or and or strategically, as uh, people of color or people who are not from the quote unquote first world um, who are writing for your audience? I know Marlon was talking about you know just writing for your just yourself in your head, but also know that white people are listening and like Americans are listening and like do you think about that and I don't know. How do you play about that? With that, thanks. Um, I think there's a is, there's a danger if you think about that too much. I think um, writer the first I, I, I really think the, the first duty of a writer is that the novel, the poem, or even the painting that's in your head is the one that should come down on the page. And I think otherwise you start to write by a committee, and the committee hasn't even formed yet. <laughs> uh, uh, and I think you, or or you start to second guess you start to second guess your audience. Um, 
Is there a price to pay for that? Yeah, you know, it's it's been a long road for for writers like myself to to get published. And I think, but I think you you I think you you think you I think I have to, for me I had to just trust that the writing will find its audience. Whether it took five, took five years or ten years, and um, and I know the audience that finds the book is not necessarily if. If we've been through this thing almost together, there's certain things I don't have to do. I don't have to pander to an audience, for example. I don't have to to drop the Jamaican patrol. Um, for you know, you know, somebody wants to meet, you know, met me and then they said, you know, um, I couldn't make it through your book. I'm like, I don't give refunds because <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the part where I just sort of don't care. And I think, I think um, we. Uh, you know, I, I teach creative writing, and one of the hardest things to get students to stop doing is pre-compromising. It's like, nobody's told yeah. you you're difficult yet. <laughs> and you're already doing this sort of pre-compromised um, kind, kind of story. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, I had to unteach that because I came out to advertising, and advertising is all about compromise. Mm -hmm. So I think you, you still ha the, the, you, you have to be true to that voice that's... that's that's in your head and have that come down, as opposed to starting to think about audience. I almost think audience is a matter of craft, not art. Is this as clear as it could have been? Should I, is this a place for a colon or a semicolon or a comma? That's where I think about audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm thinking about. Like, do you think about intentionally um, playing with structure or form, subverting it in a kind of way when you're writing about the places that you're from, or a certain place in general? I don't know. I mean, that's something anybody, everybody can answer. I think we, we, we I think you both sort of um, try to reflect the place, but also subvert it, twist it, even violate it, I think. Um, I, I, I said this, because I, you know, I write, some of the stuff I've written are based on true events, and, but the reason why I didn't write nonfiction is that I wanted to reserve the novelist's right to invent even when I'm playing with history. And, and, I, and I still hold on to that. Oh, about um, the audience and... Um, um, no, when, I, when I'm writing, um, I am only true to the thing I'm writing. And um, it is true that if I was writing something and um, one of my children was falling off, uh, I would stop and I would <laughs> rescue them. I, I, that is absolutely true. And I, but when I'm writing, I, I, you know, I was often late at the bus stop because the poor person on the page was going to drink poison, and I had to. Uh, complete the drinking or not <laughs> depends. Um, uh, but the I the idea of the audience, um, what would suit them? I, 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 there are so many things that the things that formed my writing, and maybe uh, you know um, what I'm saying. It comes from this. But there, when when I was being formed as a writer. I didn't think that the people, and, and I was reading what became, what is a canon, but I didn't think the person writing, I didn't think Milton thought, God, what would they, what would they like those people when they read this? So I didn't think the people writing the Bible or, or any of the things I read were thinking of me. So the, the idea of thinking of an audience is so ingrained in me. I, I wouldn't even know what an audience is when I'm, uh, I'm writing. And I find the um, obsession, contemporary obsession, with um, the consideration of others uh, in writing really disturbing. And um, I don't even. I mean, I. I almost can't respect a readership that would expect me to please them. And they return the favor by not buying my books. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, let's, let's take uh, one more question. Yes, ma'am. 
I would like to know what your experts think make of the notion of selective or elective affinities, Goethe's Wahlverwandtschaften, because nobody here came here by force, no, not um, um, slavery. So, so I was, when I was young, the victim of any phrase of, of any cliche you could think of. French culture, of course, that was the first thing. So I married a Frenchman. Then I fell in love with the Torero. Then it was Spain and Olé and, and, and so on. And then I uh, was uh, interested in Russian culture. I met a Russian who turned out to be American, and that's how I came here. So, but it was, I, I was never forced to go to anywhere. It was uh, just following a kind of crazy uh, caprice. And, uh, and uh, so what do you think, uh, why did you elect after all the old here, not rather by our own will? What do you think, uh, what do you elect this, this, yeah. this affinities which I thought came from me, but which were just rather uh, publicity uh, kind of cliches? What do you think of these affinities which you had, preconceived uh, feeling of relationship, cultural relationship? I don't know. I mean, well, for me, I, to go back to the, the first part of, of your remark, um, I don't think, I, I, I don't know if I, to an extent, I, I, I made a choice to come here, but I also came here because I ran out of choices. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I came here because as, you know, as, as, a writer in, in you know in a territory where writers wouldn't go very far as a gay man in a country that's not very keen on that stuff. <laughs> um, you know, part of it was a, a running out of options. It was, I mean, you know, Baldwin chose to go to France, but he also had to. You know, he had to. I think there, it's it's still. I think I I, I still think, and I think it, 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 you know, I'm not going to make conclusions for everybody here, but I think it's it's more than. A caprice is a sense. There is an urgency, I think, mm -hmm. why, why, you know, why we, we leave where we are and so on. It's not necessarily that's why the term expat is kind of tricky, and if not just outright bad. Last night I was talking how terrible the word immigrant is. Certain people get to be immigrants, and other people get to get, be migrants, and some people get to be expats, and some people get to be refugees. But there's a whole lot of discussion. That one went on for two hours. So I won't bring that one here. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think um, that there's still that there's still that kind of for for me at least, it wasn't a sense. It, there is clearly choice, like you know, I could afford my plane ticket, but there is also a sense of running out of options and a sense of needing to leave or needing, or not necessarily fleeing, but certainly leaving as a, as an act of saving oneself. So for me, yeah. uh, my affinity would be to story. Um, and storytelling, uh, and the ability to nuance the debate and to um, to uh, complicate the uh, the notions of place by bringing in new stories and sort of mashing them all together. So um, the the place that I would belong uh, would be in the process of mm. stories and storytelling. Mm. Um. Well, I'm not sure if you meant here, as in uh, New York, or here in, in a more abstract way, but if, if it's the first um, question, um, I guess it's double, double. there's two, two or three reasons, but, but to not go into all of those, I'd just say uh, there was one very instrumental um, reason, which was that I wanted to be a dancer, and there was a company here that I wanted to dance in, and I failed. So I did not become a dancer. Uh, luckily, I was never good, but I really tried hard for a few years, and it was here where I had to do that. So that's what initially brought me to New York, um, and it, it couldn't have been anywhere else. Um, but then I decided to stay here, and I stayed here for a long time. And I guess I, I since I began reading, or since I began my life as a reader, which was perhaps a little bit late, like when I was in 15 or 16, and I was, I was in high school in India, and I had a very, very good um, literature teacher um, who read to us and, and gave us to read um, Langston Hughes and Nella Larson. And I began reading about Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance in that context. And somehow it seemed like I had to end up in Harlem. I had grown up in South Africa, but I couldn't, have, I couldn't live there beyond uh, when I was 15. Um, because my parents left, so I don't know the the place like the place for me where I 
knew I had to eventually get to was Harlem, and and I've been living in, in Harlem since since I came here, um, and I guess it is through story somehow that you you fall in love with the place. Well, th there's this beautiful um, line um, by Langston Hughes himself, who says that he was already in love be with Harlem before he arrived there, and I think that I I was already in love with Harlem before I arrived there because of him. I, um, um, because of him and other people, so yeah, those that constellation of, of, of writers. There was al there was also a group of Mexican writers living in Harlem during the Renaissance. Most of them unknown, widely unread. That I eventually started reading and also became part of the sort of cohort of ghosts that 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 make me feel at home in, in that neighborhood in particular. Um, I'm trying to understand. The question, affinity, um, a place or affinity to writing, or it's a real, the interior relationship, you feel you are kind of <coughs> related to, in, to another culture. Affinity, uh, selective affinity. Yeah. Selective affinity. Oh, God. Um, what is my selective? I mean, I'm, it's my, I, I, I'm not selective. Uh, I thought writing isn't something I... To choose a point culture, just you don't know why, but you think so much of resonance in yourself, discomfort. Oh, um, resonance in myself to culture. Well, uh, I actually have no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> um, so... Um, you, you rightly distinguish between the question about coming and the question about staying. Um, I just drifted here, there was a job. Uh, I didn't think of myself as migrating or yeah. immigrating or emigrating. I just thought the best job available of, of the rather small number of job available for someone with my peculiar training happened to be in New Haven, Connecticut. So that's where I went, um, at a place I never liked. Um, <laughs> but. Um, but then, you know, at a certain point, I thought, actually, not, not New Haven, but the sort of this American academic world is kind of, uh, I don't I know it now, because everybody has to learn it as a grown up. It's not a world you grow up in. Uh, so I know it as well as anybody, because I started there. My first job was in it. And, um, and I felt that that was, I couldn't do what I wanted to do anymore anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so people would say, when are you going back to Cambridge? Or you know, are you ever going back to Ghana? And the answer is no and no. Um, I believe we're about out of time. But I want to thank our, our panelists. It's just been such a very interesting discussion. And thank you very much as well. So,